Good evening and welcome to The Right Side, the show where we talk about today's news, views and trends from an admittedly conservative perspective. I'm your host, Chris Pareja, and this evening we're joined by Yaron Brook. He's internationally known as an author, a speaker, a scholar, and Yaron, we're glad to have you in the studio with us this evening. Thanks for having me on. And so you've, you are a repeat offender. You've been <laughs> here, before. here before and I came back. <laughs> and we appreciate that even more. Uh, and lots has gone on since you've last been here, but one of the most recent things is you've written a new book. Yes, yes. And we're going straight for the third rail. We're yep. gonna place our tongue against it. Here in the, the Bay Area, it's all about equality. Yep. But your book is even entitled Equal is Unfair, Blasphemer. But what that, does that mean? But that's really the issue, right? <laughs> It, the valley is the opposite of being all about equality, right? Everybody's trying to get rich and rich big and rich fast. What, what are all these startups trying to do? There's no money involved. There's no wealth effect involved, right? Quite the contrary, what you have in, this, in the valley is a spirit of freedom, a spirit of liberty, a spirit of going out there making the most for yourself. And you've got billionaires and you've got young people coming in who can barely afford to, to rent a little place with a bunch of roommates, but they want to be successful. They want to be rich. So in many respects, the Silicon Valley is one of the last places on the planet in America where this ambition, where this idea of, of achieving, where this idea of inequality of make, doing the best that you can is still alive and well in the country. Maybe not in what people say, but in the way they act. It's interesting that you say that because here we are in the land of Bernie Sanders supporters and everything else. You've got young entrepreneurs who are starting businesses and they're saying, we want Bernie. How do you justify that? Do, do well, they this, hate themselves? What in a that? sense, in a sense, they do. In a sense, there's a there's a there's a certain sense of guilt that is associated with being successful uh, today in America, and that guilt, uh, you know, Bernie and the left generally capitalizes on that guilt. You know, we all train from when we're very little to believe that to be moral, to be good. We need to sacrifice, we need to give, we need to go to Africa, enjoy borders, you know, doctors without borders or something like that. And yet, what we really want to do is come to Silicon Valley, become an entrepreneur and make lots of money. Right. And then once we make that money, we feel guilty because we didn't go to Africa. So we support Bernie and we support Hillary and we support all the variety of causes that, that are supposedly, you know, counter to the fact that we actually achieved something with our lives. Now, I take the entrepreneur any day over the guy who goes to Africa uh, in terms of the benefit to my life, to your life and to his own life. Look, the whole issue of inequality is a bogus issue. Um, who cares? Who cares about how rich the rich get? Who cares uh, about the gap between the rich and the poor? What matters is, are people rising up? Do people have the opportunities to make their own life better? And what's beautiful about Silicon Valley is this is the land of opportunity. People have opportunities. They have opportunities because this is, again, the last industry that is relatively unregulated, that the government has, relatively speaking, left alone so that people here can actually create wealth, they can create businesses, they can hire people, they can make their dreams come true. The American dream is alive and well, again, to some extent, in Silicon Valley. That's what it's about. It's not about the gap. If everybody's rising, if everybody's better off, who cares what the difference is between the two? Right. Well, especially if you can get people to be wealthy and then feel guilty, they can do a <laughs> lot more positive for the world with actual money in their no, pockets no. than just lint and moth. See, but that's the problem. <laughs> you conservatives think this way. <laughs> no, you don't start doing good in the world after you make the money. Making money is what does good in the world. How do you make money? Right. This is one on one. How do you make money? You make money by creating great products that people want to buy. Why do they want to buy it? Because it's going to make their life better. Where do you think Bill Gates has made the world a better place more? In Microsoft or in his philanthropy? I mean, it's not even close. At Microsoft, Bill Gates changed the world. Mm -hmm. He affected every human being on the planet. He created a platform, a software, an industry that's changed everything. Okay, so now he's curing some Malaysia in Africa. Nothing wrong with that, but he's affecting maybe a few thousand people here and there. When he ran Microsoft, that profit-seeking, you know, horrible person, right? Right. He was changing the world for the better, every person in the world. So making money 
is a form of making the world a better place. Profit is a virtue. Philanthropy, charity, it's okay, nothing wrong with it. It doesn't change the world. A billion people, one billion people have come out of poverty over the last 30 years in the world. One billion people, we should be celebrating in the streets. How did they come out of poverty? Because of foreign aid? Because of charity? No, because China and India freed up their markets a little bit and allowed a little bit of capitalism. And people got rich, right? Uh, the United States, when it was founded, was a third-rate colony, right? That's why the British didn't win, because they didn't really try, right? They were too busy with real powers like the French and the Spanish. We were third-rate. Within 150 years, we were the mightiest economy in the world because of philanthropy, community service, and charity? Give, no, of course not. Entrepreneurialism. Yeah, because of businessmen. Greedy businessmen, businessmen who wanted to make money, businessmen who were working hard to make a great product that they, they could only sell to willing customers, and the product made those willing customers' lives better. So instead of calling the robber barons, they're the real heroes of America. The real heroes of America are businessmen who make everything in the world around us. Everything in the world around us is a product of some business, small business, medium-sized business, large business. But that's the real heroes of America, and that's what makes the world a better place. But you almost make it sound like they earned it instead of stole it all or something. Yeah, well, that, that, yes, they did. You know, in America, we talk about making money, not taking money, not stealing money, but making money. We talk about creating wealth. Right. Now, this is why in Europe they hate inequality. Why? Because in Europe, if you go back three, four hundred years, how did people become rich? They got rich by stealing money. I mean, what are aristocrats? They're better thieves than anybody else. That's how you get a, a title, by stealing more money than the guy next door, right? So in Europe, it was a zero-sum game. Before capitalism, before freedom, before the, before the revolution, there was the Industrial Revolution, the world was really a zero-sum game. If you look at income and wealth per capita for 10,000 years, it didn't change until about 1800 when it took off, until about really 1776 when it took off, right? So in Europe, they have this mentality that wealth, if, if you're wealthy, it means you've taken it from me, so mm -hmm. I hate you, right? In America, we have, we are a country that grew up during the Industrial Revolution. We're a country that grew up during the era of capitalism. So we believe that wealth is something you create, you build. It's not a zero-sum game, it's a win-win. If you're rich, it's, it, you become rich by making my life better. You become rich by creating products that are helping me live my life. So we've never had that envy that is so prevalent in Europe until recently. And, and this is what's so evil about the whole inequality debate, is what the left is trying to do is inculcate envy into an American people that have never known envy. Right. In, in, in survey after survey, opinion poll after opinion poll, Americans always have said in the past, we don't care about inequality. We care about my opportunity, you know, each person's opportunity. We want to be successful. We, we don't envy the guy across the street who's richer than us. We want to be the guy across the street, and we're going we're gonna to work hard to be there. That's changing, and it's changing because of propaganda on the left as, as keeps pushing this idea that inequality, as Obama says, is the era of our time. You didn't build that. Uh, uh, Pelosi just the other day said, oh, the government created the iPhone. All the technology in the iPhone is government-funded, It's got which is a load of... You know what? Plus, but it's biodegradable. You know what? I'm sure. Yes, it is biodegradable. Government so, created, but yeah. biodegradable, yeah. probably. Yeah. I mean, yeah. imagine what the iPhone would look. Imagine what the iPhone would look like if the government really did. Speaking of it. biodegradable, yeah. yes, yes. Yeah. So, this is a campaign the left has launched and has been very successful in trying to establish NV in America. And you're seeing that today, unfortunately, in in in, in Bernie Sanders' campaign, somewhat in Trump's campaign, but you're seeing this us versus them. Uh, mentality that I think is very, very destructive, that's European and un-American, but is becoming more and more America because we're becoming more and more like Europe. So that's what the book is about. The, the, the book is really to combat that. There, there, there'd be no real books on the right. Thomas Sowell wrote a short book, and there's been one or two other books, but there are very few books that have taken on the left campaign. I mean, every one of the leftists, uh, Krugman, Stiglitz, this guy, this French guy, Piketty, they've all written these big books every year. Ten books come out from the left on the evils of inequality, right? The right, zero. Well, now there's one. And, and that's, uh, that's uh, equal is unfair, uh, which, I think, which I think is crucial for us to win the battle against them. And so, you know, you brought up a couple of 
presidential candidates uh, still uh, that are there. <laughs> um, so as far as this whole battle for capitalism, if that really even exists in yep. the states anymore, which yep. is arguably probably not the case, um, versus this whole leftist propaganda driven, everything must be equal, We've got these candidates that most of the country is not excited about, but which would help to really create wealth in the, in the going forward or combat at least this notion that equal equality can be artificially created. Yeah, I don't think either one of them. I, I, I really think if you take Hillary and, and uh, Trump as the candidates, I don't think either one of them. I think both are incredibly destructive to whatever's left of capitalism in this country, whatever's left of freedom in this country, they would each destroy maybe different parts of it. They would emphasize different aspects of it, but both incredibly destructive to freedom. And look, it, there is one sense in which equality is very important, the, the sense in which the founding fathers talked about equality, and that's equality before the law and equality of freedom, equality of rights, equality of liberty. Every one of us is born free. We have a right to pursue the values that make our life the best life that it can be. We have a right to pursue our own happiness. And the inequality, the people who, who advocate for, for all these inequality uh, problems, all their solutions are always to limit our freedom and to constrain our freedom. Uh, they're all equal if you have nothing. Yes, and, and, and that's, what they, that's what they're trying to do because they, ultimately you can only be equal when you all have nothing. And look, w there are real problems in America. There's problems of poverty, there's problems of no economic growth, and there's problems of cronyism. Both Hillary and uh, Trump will do nothing about poverty. They will make it worse. They're, they're both for increasing the minimum wage. Trump is for increasing the minimum wage. Hillary is. The minimum wage is one of the dumbest, stupidest. Uh, uh, no real economist uh, believes the minimum wage is good. It's, it's a net drain economically, and it puts the poorest of the poor. It hurts teenage, uh, teenagers in inner cities the most, right, in poor neighborhoods. Uh, neither of them will do anything about economic growth. Neither of them has any solutions for it. Trump wants a trade war with China. <laughs> that will destroy economic growth. That could spiral the world into a depression. It could, it's probably one of the worst economic policies I can imagine. And in terms of cronyism, can you imagine a more crony pair than, than Hillary, who receives money, and Trump, who's been spending money their entire lives manipulating the system? Both of them are complete cronies. They're both manipulated. And so, they've collaborated before on yes, this and, effort. And, yeah, <laughs> Trump has actually given Hillary, you know, to buy favors, and he's admitted it. He, the, the one thing about Trump you have to give him credit for is he doesn't seem to be ashamed, embarrassed <laughs> about his cronyism, which says something about an electorate who's willing to elect somebody who says, yeah, I'm a crony, cool. Uh, you know, that, that, that's nuts. That's so un-American. That's so against everything we believe in. And yet people are voting for him under the belief that he will end cronyism. No, he's going to make it much worse. So we've got candidates who are going to hurt the poor, hurt economic growth in, in the middle class, therefore, and make cronyism more prevalent in this country, not less prevalent in this country. So on every important issue, on the real problems that we face, not this inequality non-issue, both candidates are awful, and really the, 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 there's, a, there's a dearth of solutions out there because nobody has the courage to actually advocate for, for policies which America used to stand for, the policies of the founding fathers. Well, but I'm sure they've got to have some good attributes, like foreign policy or something, right? <laughs> I mean, you, you said, okay, well, Trump could kick off a trade war with the rest of the world. Yeah, but I mean, I'm sure Hillary's, you know former secretary. No, I, 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 I suspect that neither <laughs> one of them have any positive attributes in, in, any, in any area, and I would probably find myself disagreeing vehemently with both on almost everything. Um, you know, the, 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 I'd say the only virtue that Donald Trump I can think of really has is the fact that he's not PC. I'm, I'm very pro not being PC. I'm a huge advocate of free speech. You got to say it like it is, and, and uh, that speech needs to be protected no matter how offended people are. Yeah. The whole point of free speech, the whole point of the First Amendment is to protect you from offending, for, for, uh, you have right to offend me. Uh, remember, the, uh, the United States of America was founded by a bunch of guys who offended the British, right? Uh, read the Declaration of Independence sometimes. It's a very offensive document if you're King George. Right. Well, but I mean, but but it doesn't sound like either of them is really a big fan of the First Amendment outside of them speaking, though, either. 
No, neither one. Uh, I mean, Donald Trump has is, is talked about expanding libel laws, and you can't, you can't offend him. He's allowed to offend everybody, but you can't offend him. He has a very, very thin skin. And I feel what that means when he's in the White House. And of course, Hillary Clinton is part of a leftist establishment that doesn't believe free speech uh, is a right that, uh, again, you can't offend through speech. Donald Trump, uh, people don't remember this, but after Garland, Texas, uh, the shooting in Garland, Texas, which nobody remembers, nobody even mentioned that, that it was about a year ago, it was a year and a month ago, almost exactly ago, when, when two uh, uh, Muslim radicals wanted to shoot up this cartoon contest, this Muhammad cartoon contest. And right after that, Donald Trump's response and Bill O'Reilly's response and much of Fox's response, this is the right, was kind of, they asked for it, you know. Stop drawing these cartoons, and, and, and they'll stop shooting at you. That is defeatism. That is horrible. That is, that is the opposite of what free speech means. Uh, I mean, that, that, that the founding fathers would be horrified by a view like that. Yeah, it is interesting that um, people think that they have a right not to be offended. But, but the, as you're, And we're seeing point. that on campuses, right, with what they're calling the snowflake uh, 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 generation, where you can't offend anybody. They, they now have s uh, safe spaces where you can go hug, hug a teddy bear. If I say something you don't like, you know, we've got sofas over there, you can go hug a teddy bear, and there's calm music going on. I mean, really? At a university where you're supposed to be challenged, you're supposed to be pushed, you're supposed to be exposed to their way of ideas. Uh, you can't offend people. Now they have trigger warnings. The curriculum now has, oh, you might be offended by this reading, so you can you can excuse yourself from reading it. You you don't have to sit in on this class because you might find something that the professor says offensive. Well, you use words like founding fathers, and that assigns a gender role yes, to a absolutely. leadership role. Yes, You know, a lot of these yeah. things somebody is going to be <laughs> offended by. And certainly if you come to one of my speeches, lots of trigger warnings. I'm going to offend a lot of different people. Equally? Uh, uh, probably not equally, because oh. I don't believe in equality after all. Uh, I only believe in equality before the law. And look, the solutions to poverty, the solutions to, money. to ridiculous <laughs> economic growth, and the solutions to cronyism are all the same. They're freedom. Freedom is the solution to all these problems. And yes, making money, the freedom to make money. But you know what? Some of us choose not to make money. Some of us choose to be teachers. Some of us choose professions where we know we're not, because we love it, right? The, the, the Declaration of Independence doesn't say you have the right to make money. You do, but you have a right to pursue happiness. Right. Some of us do that by becoming entrepreneurs in Silicon Valley. Some people do it by becoming teachers. Some do it by, by becoming car mechanics. Whatever it is that you choose to pursue you should be free to pursue it. And, and it's freedom that is the key. Uh, it's, it's, the, it's the liberty to say, to think, and to pursue rational values that are going to lead to your own happiness. That's what this country was found, the principle was founded on. And you're right, we're not capitalist anymore. We're not free anymore. Now everything's by, by permission. We're crony. I call us the, a, a regulatory welfare state, right? The state regulates everything. So of course we're crony. You know, if you're going to regulate my life, I'm going to try to influence you. Because I'm going to try, you know, there's, there's the famous Microsoft story. Uh, in the early 90s, Microsoft didn't lobby, didn't go to Washington, didn't have any lawyers, didn't have a building in the beltway, nothing. And they were brought in front of the Senate. And they were said, you better start lobbying by a Republican, Armin Hatch. You better start lobbying. You need to have a presence in Washington, D.C. What do you guys think you're doing? And Microsoft walked away and said, you know, you leave us alone, we'll leave you alone. We're not interested. Guess what happened six months later? knock on the door. We're from the Justice Department, and we think it's wrong of you to be giving away Internet Explorer for free. So we're going to sue you. Guess what Microsoft learned from that after more than a decade in, in federal court? They, they learned from that they better lobby. So today they spent tens of millions of dollars. They've got this beautiful building about equal distance from the White House and Congress. Right there, it's beautiful glass gorgeous building. They spent a lot of money on these politicians now. They've learned their lesson. Cronyism is a, is, a, is a feature of statism. That's why I never say crony capitalism. Capitalism is the absence of cronyism. Cronyism is a feature of socialism, fascism, any form of statism necessitates cronyism. Well, but in that case, I mean, they're actually, I mean, just demanding ransom yep. to be able to stay in business. And yep. I mean, if you look at this whole thirst for equality, and you look at the Silicon Valley as an example, it's interesting to me that, for example, we insist that minimum wage be raised and everything else, but 
entrepreneurs don't go in it for money at all or someone who would be willing to intern for free to build their resume their opportunity is actually taken away if they have to charge money to sure. get that opportunity my, my son works uh, my son writes comedy uh, in Hollywood, he, you know how he much wants they pay? to starve to death. You know how Obviously. much they pay? Zero. <laughs> exactly. And he performs, and he writes, and zero. Exactly zero. No minimum wage applies to them. No minimum wage applies to interns. No minimum wage applies to middle class type jobs where you know those kids are going to find a way to survive in spite of the fact that they're getting paid zero. Where the people we are screwing, the people we are consciously screwing when we raise the minimum wage, are the people who have the least voice are the people who have the fewest opportunities. The inner city, typically minority youth. And, and, and look, the minimum wage was instituted when it was first instituted. It was a program instituted by the unions to keep minorities out. They didn't want the labor competition. So they raised the minimum wage so they could price those people out. And it's, it's doing the same thing today. And this is why unions support it. But it goes beyond that. I mean, recently in Oakland, they raised the minimum wage. Walmart said we can't afford to pay people anymore. They shut down the store, yeah. so 500 jobs lost. Of course. But additionally, all of the low-cost goods that were available yeah. before are, gone. are now gone. Are so gone. the the community is impacted multiple times by this. But of course, but, of but course, if you think about it, Walmart evil. Yes, Walmart is Walmart is the problem. They should have subsidized this. They should have taken a loss in order to do this. But look, that's the reality. If if McDonald's has to pay 15 bucks an hour, they're going to they automate. Can, they can do a few things. They can automate. Right, they, you go in and an, press an iPad. Now they're machines that'll flip the whole burger. They'll do the whole thing. Right, uh, they can automate, or they can raise prices on the on the on the hamburgers. Now both. I know you eat at McDonald's, but I don't. <laughs> Most people who eat at McDonald's are low income people, and they're going to raise the price of McDonald's in order to pay the low income people more. I mean, the whole thing is ludicrous and nuts. And again, it's hurting the people, but nobody cares. You see, the left doesn't care about poor people; they care about power. Yeah. They care about maintaining their position as seeming to help the poor people and maintaining control on all of us. That's what the real agenda is. And they're being very successful at it. You have to give them credit for, for basically winning the battle because we're losing. Right. Those of us who believe in freedom are clearly losing in this country. Yeah, it's a shame. And if they raise the prices too much at McDonald's, entrepreneurs like me won't be able to afford to eat. So. <laughs> <laughs> you, you better get an exit on that company quickly. You know, it's, it's an inducement to make more money. Right? Uh, yeah, exactly. So it's, it's an incentive structure. No, it's, it's the fact is that we have distorted. And it's not, look, it's not just minimum wage. It's licensing laws. In California, you need a license to shampoo hair. Right? Who does that hurt? I mean, it, it, it's not people with dirty me. hair. Yeah, yeah it's I mean, it's not. It, 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 it's hurting poor people who are trying to get a job. Shampoo here. You need a license to open a nail salon. Who does that hurt? A young, you know, entrepreneur who's trying to start a business. Instead of making it simple for people to rise up, we make it harder and harder and harder. And the more we regulate, the the less businesses are going to invest. The less businesses are going to grow. The fewer jobs they're going to be. And then surprise, surprise, we wake up one morning, and the economy is not growing more than one percent a year for years. You know, Japan's been living this for 20-something years. You'd think we'd learn something, but they we learn nothing. They just haven't done it right. Yeah. And, and instead, <laughs> we want to debate inequality. We want to debate the gap. Let's not debate the actual problems. Let's debate the gap. The gap is irrelevant. There's no economic theory, no empirical fact. There's no evidence, zero evidence that suggests that the gap has any negative consequences at all. Quite the contrary. The fact that there's a gap often incentivizes people. So appreciate you sharing and the passion with which you do it. We do have to go for now. Quickly, website so people can find you. Aynrand.org. A-Y-N-R-A-N-D dot O-R-G. Thanks, Ron. If you pleasure. hold on for just a moment, we'll be right back after a word from our underwriters, the Conservative Forum. Some people think that a meeting of conservatives in Silicon Valley could fit in a small room. In fact, when the Conservative Forum was founded in 2003, we did meet in a small room, a coffee shop in San Jose. It doesn't get more grassroots than this. It may surprise you that there are thousands of people right here in Silicon Valley who share your principles of liberty, free markets, and limited government. Since our humble beginnings in that coffee shop, we've outgrown three meeting halls. From San Jose to Gilroy to Mill Valley, we bring hundreds of people together each month from all over the Bay Area to promote the principles of American liberty. How do we do it? 
It starts with a stellar lineup of speakers. Speakers like Steve Forbes, Senator Jim DeMint, Dr. Victor Davis Hansen, Lieutenant Colonel Alan West, Andrew Breitbart, Pamela Geller, and many others. These speakers passionately articulate our shared principles and remind us why conservatism isn't just the smart choice, it's also the moral choice. Our monthly meetings are only one dimension of the forum. We underwrite The Right Side, a monthly television show on cable access channel KMVT. We also host a monthly constitution discussion group and provide tables at our meetings for more than a dozen local groups who share our love of liberty to promote their specific cause. The Conservative Forum is the premier place in Silicon Valley for conservatives to gather, become invigorated, motivated, and empowered. We welcome guests to our monthly meetings and offer special discounted pricing to first-time visitors. Take a look at our speaker lineup in the coming months and join us to learn why we say liberty is made in America. And welcome back to The Right Side. That was a word from our underwriters, the Conservative Forum. And while we tremendously respect and appreciate the forum because they've made this show possible for five seasons now, we're really not what they're best known for. What they're best known for is their speaker series, which includes guest celebrities from around the country and around the world, including Yaron Brook, who was with us this evening. And that's the reason we actually got to bring him on the show was because we often get to talk to the speakers there and warm them up for the big show at 432 Stirling Road here in Mountain View, uh, the second Tuesday of each month. In July, Nick Adams, the founder and executive director of the Foundation for Liberty and American Greatness, flag, uh, will be speaking. And in August, Andrew C. McCarthy, uh, special, that's going to be a special event. He's a best-selling author and a frequent guest commentator at Fox News. He'll be there. If you need more information, visit the website at theconservativeforum.com for more details about showtimes, etc. But in closing this evening, we'd just like to encourage you to learn more about Yaron Brook at Ayn Rand uh, Institute and the things that they're doing there to help keep speech free and competitive with other ideas, uh, such as the march to the left that we seem to be taking as a country. I'm sure you'll find yourself educated and with new perspectives by visiting the site there. We'd like to thank you for joining us this evening on The Right Side. I'm your host, Chris Pareja. We've enjoyed having you. We'll look forward to seeing you in person or on the show sometime soon. But if you just can't wait, reach out to us at therightsidetv at gmail.com and we'll get your questions answered as quickly as possible. Thanks again and have a great night.